Right, so uh, I am Shankar and uh, our project is called NIFTY, which is uh, National Human-Robot Interaction in Dynamic Environments. So uh, our focus is on uh, human-robot teaming and urban search and rescue. So uh, the, the way that we've approached this project is by uh, understanding USAR as a collaboration uh, task between uh, different groups of people and the robot and well the uh, rescue workers, the uh, programmers and uh, or the support personnel, technical support personnel and uh, the, uh, the robots themselves. So uh, we look at this as a uh, dynamic socio-technical system and uh, our approach is which is quite common in, uh, in software, for example, is to design from user needs. And we have uh, you've done this from, from the get-go. So, uh, so our, our basic approach, which we've been using for the last two and a half years, the, uh, uh, we have a year and a half left, is to uh, use the functionality that works in field and leave out what doesn't get used. So if we find that something that's developing is not getting used, we would uh, either change it to uh, fit the needs of the firefighters, the rescue personnel, or leave it out entirely. So uh, what is human-robot teaming about? It's, uh, like I said, a variety of uh, a, a different, I mean, uh, uh, like a lot of different personnel and robots coming together and uh, working together and that neatly fits into our our logo here. Uh, so the, the, uh, the extent of our project is four years and we have uh, a total of ten partners of which uh, two are rescue personnel. So that's the uh, fire department in Dortmund and there's a fire department in Italy as well. And uh, we have a dedicated human factors partner, which is TNO Sisterberg, which uh, who oversee this the interaction between the uh, fire safety personnel and the robots and the technical personnel. And they play a very primary, a uh, very important role in uh, at every stage of our development. So uh, they tell us what. Uh, which parts of our software we should develop further, which is not, what is not necessary, and what they conduct uh, user-driven user tri uh, trials to see uh, what needs that we, we would require in future scenarios and which we should leave out. And we have uh, the other partners of Fraunhofer, which deals with the, some amount of mapping, the UAV control, and uh, as well as the overall integration, uh, CVUT, which is in Prague, the Czech technical school in Prague, which deals with the uh, image image analysis and image processing and so on, and ET at Zurich, which is the mapping partner for for the ground robot, uh, and the um, yeah, and the La, Pies La, Sapienza, uh, La Sapienza University in Rome, which is the partner for planning. And Blue Borics, which has developed this platform for us, uh, and uh, during during this development of this platform, as I'll explain in some future slides, they used uh, a lot of input from human factors person uh, from from the human factors department in TNO as well. So uh, right, and our reviewers are Rob uh, Rob Murphy, San, uh, Candy Sidner, and. Uh, uh, Jan Olaf Eklund, uh, some of whom might be familiar to you. And uh, yes, so it's natural human robot teaming in complex dynamic environments. Right, so this is our general uh, system, what, what we do every year, which is we have uh, trials, experimental evaluations. Well, it's not in any particular order, but we just say that we have, let's say, well, yeah, so. Uh, ex experimental evaluation, which which are uh, then analyzed by our human factors uh, team, TNO, 
uh, who tell us what to develop, component technology development, and then uh, and then we have a lot of integration meetings where we put all these components together. So we do this each of these steps either once or twice a year. We have dedicated meetings where we come together to do each of these things. Of course, the uh, component development we would do it separately in our uh, own institutes. So this is what happens typically every year, and we do each of these once or twice a year. We found it to be helpful as actually. So our approach is human-assisted exploration, which means we use uh, we don't look at it look at the problem as uh, robotic exploration, autonomous exploration, but rather what the robot can do to help the uh, fire safety personnel or the rescue personnel and how they could use that. So it's, it's more of an assistance role which the robot plays for the, in, the, in the team. Right, so this is, uh, we use uh, realistic use cases. This is an example of a tunnel use case where a lorry inside a tunnel has hit a few cars and it's lost its, the load that it was carrying and some of it might be hazmat stuff in barrels and so on and we have victims inside cars. Uh, and like I said, we do these kind of evaluations. We've done t about uh, three or four in the last two and a half years, so we do it quite often. And uh, yes, we have rescue personnel all the, time, uh, all the time participating with us in these evaluations, evaluating the robot, trying out the robot, and trying out the different systems we're developing. Right, so this, the whole video is just a lot of victims in different positions. So just following through. Yes, so uh, like I said, we didn't develop, develop the robot we, we currently using. Uh, we didn't have it in the first year. So uh, we, have, we were just using the Pioneer P2, P2 and uh, hooked up with a, with a MacBook of handy place behind so you can program whenever you want it and uh, yeah stuff taped around with tape cell tape and wires everywhere a real mess but this was just basically to see well to see if, if the rescue workers could even use this in the first place and to in in developing a new platform this was crucial this kind of a test initially so uh, Yes, then after that test, we were, uh, there, was a, there was a report in the German newspaper about us and the fire chief told, uh, fire chief when asked, fire chief of Dortmund when asked if, uh, if this kind of robot would ever be of use, which this prototype, which we just taped up together, would ever be of use for rescue personnel. Uh, reply, replied with a crisp or like a curt no and then went on to say uh, not in my lifetime or not in this lifetime and uh, so yeah so but we did take their input and their comments and everything into consideration and in the development of our platform and we decided that yes we need to make some changes uh, our partner Blue Borix put together all the information that we gathered from the rescue workers and the uh, human factors team and everything and from us developers as well and came up with this uh, with our our nifty robot we don't have a name for it just nifty one and as you can see here it has a, a sick laser scan on the front it has a, a, a ladybug 3 omni camera and that is a series of in the back, the UAV there is not what I'm going to talk about right now, but that is one in a series of UAVs that uh, we develop, which I'll talk about later. So, some basic stats about our robot. It has a ground clearance of 15 centimeters. It has a passive adaptation with differentials, which you can lock if necessary through software. Uh, flip four flippers, uh, sensor suite which is controlled from inside. And uh, we, as I will show you, it has some amount of automation potential, which is 
you know, certain factors where we we thought automation was necessary we have integrated into the profile. So this kind of a platform is really useful in really adverse terrain and this is a, a, a collage of different photos of where the robot's been and what it's done. I think that one of them, I guess this one is like a, a pose obviously, right? And that was for Christmas with the, uh, with the red nose and the antlers. This is actually quite interesting. It's a really steep staircase. It was uh, our fire training school in uh, in Dortmund, uh, and that was a, a really steep uh, circular staircase, which is even difficult for human beings. And we were doing this through remote operation, but with like with the we didn't have a UAV at that time, but we wanted to test how that would be, and we had person there saying, you know, left flipper up, right flipper down. This was quite early on in our, in our experiments. But we did climb that such a complicated staircase as well. This is a really steep uh, spiral staircase or something. This is definitely a challenge. That's quite early on in our demo. So, uh, yes, so like I said, that's really adverse terrain. And we team up with it or against it. Uh, with fire safety personnel, uh, programmers, and see how we can deal with this kind of a situation. Uh, we performed some exercises in 2011 uh, with our new robot, <coughs> six months from these exercises with the Pioneer PR2. And we had this uh, multi floor burning building with smoke and everything. And we saw, we, we saw what fire safety personnel could do in terms of tasks like you know, climbing up a staircase. What we could do as well, but we give, we control it sometimes and we give them the control sometimes. Uh, and we, we evaluated this, this scenario and we found that the press and the fire chief was a little more impressed than the last time. He says, yeah, this, uh, the first use in practice is not yet within our reach, but just within our, yet to be within our reach. I hope I'm translating that properly. <laughs> right, so uh, yes, which is encouraging and tells us that uh, the direction that we're going in is, is correct. And like I said, it's very important to us what these, uh, what they say, what the rescue personnel tell us. Uh, this was a crucial factor in the development robot system. So then we took it to the tunnel accident scenario where there were complex environmental conditions, un uneven terrain uh, sometimes, uh, and uh, rocks and everything thrown everywhere, obstacles which have fallen off the, the panel, cars in several positions, victims outside, uh, crashed van for example and no knowledge of course of the tunnel itself, which could, it, it could be useful, but not at this, we didn't use it in this case. Uh, right. And we did, uh, we deployed a, uh, an earlier version of the UAV at that time, and of course rescue personnel and technical personnel. And we uh, had the first prototype of our idea of what a rescue team should look like with robots which I think is interesting in a, uh, for to take home to see see if this really works for you guys who try it out. Uh, what we have typically is in field we have we, this is what we did in the first year so we evaluated it and saw what it was like. We have the U UGV and the UAV with the UAV operator in field. Uh, this was in the first year and. There was radio and uh, Wi-Fi communication to a uh, ground station, which was remotely located, and had uh, a terminal with the UAV camera and UAV uh, acts, uh, yeah, well, both the UAV saw and you could see the, the laser scans in it, uh, the UGV terminal, and a TREX terminal, which is uh, a terminal that is, uh, well, this is a software developed by the human factors uh, Personal TNO, which was used to um, to 
make a recording of what the uh, of what the what the, uh, the safety personnel using the UGV saw and noticed. So if you'd see a victim, you'd say, "I see a victim uh, ahead of me in, in a blue car there," and he'd be instructed to put a put a icon or a, a um, icon or label of a blue car in that position. And we used this data and uh, also victims, obviously, where a victim was found, and so on, and obstacles as well, and dangerous obstacles. And we uh, we correlated that data with the real ground truth data, obviously. And uh, well, this was useful in evaluating from a human factors perspective if the system itself is usable, and also useful in terms of seeing if uh, our mapping and uh, our uh, cameras were uh, usable by, which is useful for us to see what we, uh, what we had deployed, the software we had deployed was usable. And typically we'd also have a mission com commander, mission specialist who knew about this scenario, who would uh, give instructions if necessary to the UGB operator. Right, so human ex assisted exploration. Human team supervises a UGV with shared control, which is we had some autonomous tasks, waypoint planning, and so on, and uh, we had a UAV operator, which is not autonomous. And this is a uh, rather complex overview of our whole system put together, the technical part of it. But you will see that here, at the top level, we have a lot of uh, factors from um, from the users, from the uh, fire safety themselves. So, based upon, like I said, we have a human factors uh, uh, team, so which assess stuff like task load, attention, uh, in and uh, well workflow practices, which is to mean what uh, the kind of the kind of steps that. Uh, uh, user or fire safety person would be doing um, and especially in conditions of stress these things are difficult to assess and uh, task load and attention really vary or rather become very concentrated in, in stressful scenarios so uh, so balancing that cognitive load with what we display on our screens to them kind of information we give them. We don't want to give them too much information and distract them, but rather give them the information that they require. And uh, the kind of, and also the, any kind of planning that we, uh, planning interface that we have would depend upon, also upon the cognitive load that the, uh, the rescue personnel can take at that moment. So our interface should be, should be uh, designed for their, their use. Right, so uh, we keep a, a log of the situated exploration history, where the robot has gone, what it's seen, and so on. And, and so we have, we go top down, and we can up down bottom up as well, and reach there. Uh, so we collect information, we have metrical maps, observation models, uh, gathered by the, uh, by the cameras and, and, <coughs> and the laser scans as well. And uh, we have what, what we call functional topological maps, which are uh, common, uh, which are objects of interest inside the inside the metrical map, as well as what you can do from where. Uh, well, certain actions are performable on objects of interest. For example, inside a car, you can search, look inside for victims, and a functional map would define where that action is performed on this object of interest. And that comes up to what we present to the uh, to the user or the rescue personnel. So this uh, comprises our whole general view of intelligence in, in our system. In our system. Right. So which uh, which for the rescue personnel is a kind of situation awareness. What is where and. Uh, yeah, a balanced approach so that they know what they need to know and we cut out the factors that 
I don't know if necessary for them or not. Or they, they do not want to know. Right, so I have a couple of videos here. That's uh, the metrical mapping process in for the UGB and some stats there. If you see there, I'll just forward it. This was inside a, a, a simulation in Zurich, a, a, a building with some, I think, with some victims and so on. Just forward. You'll see quite high density and a good graph. Uh, well, for the exact specifics, I can direct you to the papers which, which have more information about these. Uh, we'll, we'll extract information. And that started. Yes, is our UAV showing its. Uh, perception and its mapping and like uh, Stefan said it uses Hector Thank you. And uh, so this is a, an office environment where it, you could, as you can see it is quite useful in mapping at least a stationary environment. Yes, so we have uh, laser range data collected from the rotating sick laser, uh, assembled in point clouds using ICP and SNAP as well, fast ICP. So uh, faster than they able, uh, the mapping part is able to achieve faster than real time processing of laser data, which is good. And the density sub they use density subsampling to keep resource requirements constant. And they did this results in a 3D metrical map for span. I'll show you some more examples. And we do we perform at this stage. We perform some amount of uh, traversability analysis, which we could extract the, the ground plane and certain slopes. We could detect gaps. Uh, we could do some amount of autonomous gap traversal. So if, if the robot reaches a certain point and realizes there's a gap in front of it it would uh, alert the operator, and the operator would say, yes, go ahead and traverse the gap and use its flippers. And, uh, and it would also make an assessment of whether it could go over, over that gap or not, uh, which was done using the uh, laser, of course. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the terrain analysis and the ground flow extraction is used for planning paths. I'll explain that a little later. So yeah, track reversal works almost always. This is an example of a multi-floor map, map which was uh, which was done by our uh, our partners in Zurich, the mapping partners, ETH Zurich, and this is all online. And uh, yeah, the floor extraction is also done. Online. This is a seventh floor building, which they've done not completely. And what we uh, use for path planning, as a brief overview of that, is we have, uh, <coughs> we have like, uh, we extract, we do floor extraction, and then we have, we have some segmentation, and we make Bornoi region, regions, and we're able to use this in a, as a as a graph to uh, in planning, path planning, and uh, when we find uh, an object of interest, we just add it as an extra node in the graph, uh, and then we use path planning. For more information about this, also I have a few papers if anyone's interested. Right. So uh, our, our image partners to object detection, the three localization and also victim classification uh, to a certain extent. So it's not, uh, the, especially the victim classification part is not extremely robust, but we do use it. 
Well, it says robust 2D and 3D object detection. <laughs> to be honest, I, I wouldn't say that robust. But I'll show you the papers and you make that decision yourself. Uh, we use an omnidirectional camera on the robot. And we focus on domain specific objects, which in this scenario we've identified as cars, crashed cars, and, uh, and victims. Uh, and we map the D3 detection with the laser scan, so we're able to point out where the victims are. Full crowd false positives, and we're also able to uh, map the visual features from the uh, image feed to the 3D data. This is uh, some, a small overview of what I do, which is, uh, this is, in this domain, it would be looking victim search inside crashed cars and where the robot should be ideally to do this more efficiently. So um, I'll go into more detail about this afterwards perhaps if you want to discuss it with me. But the idea is basically um, in, a, in a more broader perspective it is to it is optimal positions to perform certain actions. And this could be either used as an input to path planning, or it could be used as an input to the operator uh, as, an, as, a, as an option if he wants to, if the, if the robot proposes a certain path, and these, these poses can be shown, and the operator can decide whether he wants the robot to go this way, and decide, make his, make human judgment, and decide if what the robot is doing is really correct or not. So uh, this is another abstraction of how uh, we go from from what we from the data we collect to all the way up to functional maps. We have uh, laser scans, horizontal scans, as assembled point clouds, make a three D local map. I mean, three local map, three D local map. Uh, floor and obstacle map, manifold map with objects, topological map with identifying objects of interest and so on, and make a functional map with actions performed upon the objects. We also have input from the visual features. So again, all these things that I described to you are all parts of this process, this planning. There's a uh, functional mapping with people. Uh, Observational models and detected uh, detected objects and so on. Be here, metrical maps be here, and then uh, another factor that's very important to our project is communication for joint exploration. It's not an easy uh, easy topic because you have different agents, and each agent has a different uh, different worldview and different beliefs and intentions about. It. Objects in that world. Uh, so, situated communication is a, word, a term that we use in our lab to talk about objects of interest, where they are, and what actions are performed on them from both the robot's perspective and the human's perspective, and a combination of that so that uh, we can give directions to the robot. That's the same thing. So, yeah, so uh, we have uh, different roles inside the team, and each of these roles require information. They have different responsibilities and different limits, uh, <coughs> different capabilities, expectations, and trust, and several different kinds of operation and tactical communications. There's communications between team members, human members between the uh, team members and the robot, and among the robots themselves. <coughs> different kinds of intentions, beliefs, and trust between all of these agents. And uh, these needs and uh, these needs define different perspectives for each of these agents, for which uh, to clarify these to make this a transition between these perspectives, we have uh, several interfaces which convey just the right amount of information between these agents. And 
uh, making this common ground between all of these different fat, different agents in a human robot team is a fundamental problem in the HRI. So uh, this is an overview of our specific team and the different agents in that and the, the kind of instructions that they give each other. So for example, uh, we have the, uh, the mission director who's in charge of the pilot in command of the mission specialist, who acts as a pilot in command of the mission specialist. And he gives instructions to the pilot of the UGB, uh, confirms orders, it's not very clear. Uh, you put, yeah, and, and this kind of uh, de uh, very detailed uh, reporting structure between different agents inside the USAR scenario. So uh, this is clearly a challenge, and but it, it is uh, yeah it is the kind of uh, collaboration that we do in in our in our project. The, this is some examples of the displays that we use. This is the display for the UGB, and you can see there a gazebo model which, oh well not a gazebo, a URDF model that we uh, use, which we overlay onto our uh, robot uh, to give both the virtual uh, virtual uh, aspect as well as a real aspect of the robot and see that they, can, they match. Uh, and an overlay of the 3D medical maps onto the real scenario. That is the trench system just talking about where uh, the pilot of the UGB or the UAV or the mission director can say, I've seen this here, I've seen a cow here, I've seen explosive battles over here, here's where I gave the arm, there's a victim over there, and we use this later to see how well we've done in this kind of specific mission. And uh, while these, these people are operating the robot and uh, giving instructions to it and so on. We have, we have a bunch of other people who observe what they do. For example, the human factors observer <coughs> will, uh, will look at this overall interaction and assess how we'll be doing and make notes of it and so on. We have a uh, brief record all our, uh, all our uh, experiments and all our uh, evaluations and we sync them with our, uh, our bag files and uh, the different kinds of data that we, that we acquire. We have uh, a visit of us person which is like, uh, which is to compensate for, um, for natural, natural uh, speech recognition and not being perfect at this time. So you can give instructions, you can hear what the mission commander says and give instructions to the robot through a dialogue, through an interface. dialogue interface. So again, all these human factors, components also come into our, our total picture on top of here and play a role in connecting with the master. So yes, is this really working for us? It's a question. I mean, uh, we can do our trials and everything, but in, in simulated environments. But when we come, will it really work in a real situation? Yeah. And uh, so these are uh, an overview of our scientific achievements. Uh, situation awareness in terms of 3D and 2D, 3D spatial and temporal metric maps to be. Uh, dynamic topological maps, functional mapping, video streaming, car object detection, train classification, human body part classification, localization, uh, multimodal human robot interaction in different kinds of systems, the TREX system, the, uh, the GUIs that we developed for the UAV and the UGV, uh, stress level recognition spoken communication, which is one part of our. Uh, our spoken for our dialogues, uh, dialogue analysis, uh, communication.
communication methods. <coughs> uh, determining stuff, uh, determining cognitive and emotional task loads upon team members and rescue personnel. Um, yes, so we have a very useful robot platform with active and passive morphological adaptation. And uh, we perform user evaluations quite often, which uh, validate our test method, of, uh, our design methodology and uh, general, uh, general uh, project overview. Right, here's uh, a piece of hardware that was just installed recently, that's the, the robot arm, and uh, we just installed it about four or five months back. Uh, we've just deployed it in certain test scenario with a control one, but this is just an example of it in a regular parking lot and of this music as well. And there was music in a lot of other videos, I guess. So did I show you? Yeah, but uh, you'll see some uh, communication before we some other videos. So it has quite a high reach really be used to see inside files. The rest of it's about the same in different directions, fast and slow as well. <coughs> quite a long reach. Yes, so uh, we're, we're two years into, two and a half years into a project. For the first two years, our focus has been on this uh, car crash scenario and tunnels. And uh, this year, our focus is on uh, a freight train accident. So, trains uh, collapsing, I mean, uh, crashing each other and collapsing. Uh, and we've done some pre preliminary trials in such an accident. So Here you can see uh, this is autonomous driving, uh, autonomous flipper control. So the user just says, brand new technology for us, so we haven't uh, tested this with end users yet. We would do that in the following year. It's reasonably uh, intelligent, uh, going slower when it comes to uh, more challenging situations. Adjusting its flippers when this stuck. Actually, a lot of this uh, this motion was what, from what we observed, which was that this kind of autonomous motion was is, is quite simple if you keep the angle of the front and the back flippers constant. So you can see what they. I think you might notice that I'll just I wouldn't play that game. but uh, I'm also kind of running out. So I'm okay. So, uh, yes, so, um, well, I'll just show that again. So, what you can see, the, if you see these angles are always constant, and which we've seen as a reasonably good way to, uh, at least for a simple kind of auton uh, autonomous motion, this, this kind of a snake motion. Obstacles of a certain height, and uh, well, also uniform obstacles. I guess you have to approach it from 
an orthogonal direction. So uh, we did deploy recently uh, an earthquake in real life after a real, real earthquake in Mirandola, Italy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a region that has a lot of uh, cultural uh, buildings, artifacts, historical buildings, which sustain a lot of damage and we were called in to assess this damage. And uh, during this structural damage assessment, uh, two firefighters were actually killed during the recovery that I see in collapse. So it really shows that we do require some uh, amount of, I mean, if a robot was there instead of that, that would be a big difference. So we were called in to do some uh, damage assessment. A certain, a certain city and a, a few structures which we were called to survey. So this is a chapel, a uh, chapel. Uh, yeah. So, so most of the scenery collapsed and one, one path was clear which we decided to go. We use both the UAV and the UGV. UAV first to assess the uh, the scenario and to see which terrain was accessible and so on. Uh, this is a bit of the UAV, UAV flight. And uh, altogether, we did about four hours, five hours of in-field uh, deployment, and we recorded everything. So this is useful for the uh, this kind of uh, the damage assessment. assessment provided important information about reversibility and also um, which parts of the building were necessary to explore and which part which we worked with the firefighters and uh, the ministry personnel to see which parts of the building they wanted to explore and which parts were actually possible by us. So this is just a few months back I was said. Very useful exercise in an actual scenario of post <coughs> Would you feel that, like, uh, if the dust <coughs> is the environment disturbed at the moment? It, it does to the uh, UAV. Dust can get stuck into the, the rotors. So that can, uh, that did make us come back a few times. And uh, the total is, UAV. Is that, is that maintainable or is it going to clean it up and then put it back in or is it a lot of hard work? It's not that uh, it's not that much hard work since this is a UAV that we built ourselves. So the person who built it is the person flying it. So he just takes it apart, cleans it really fast, and sends it back. In. And it's a very simple UAV built from practically from homemade material, double pipes, and plastic pipes. So each UGV mission lasts half an hour. After which we came back. Uh, the UAV missions also altogether will tell you how long they last. Uh, we also, the UAV team actually flew in to the church itself, into the nave, but it was deemed that the UGV shouldn't go inside there because it was still structurally unstable. And the UAV also did a com uh, complete overview of the building. Uh, And 
should tell you there should be some measures of uh, how long is supposed to last and how long hold it last. Yes. So this is yeah, so two hours, not four hours, right? Two hours of push information. But uh, yes, yeah, so a very useful exercise in seeing if our system was actually usable in a natural earthquake scenario, not in simulations, <coughs> just test it over I don't think we have a paper out on this as of at the moment, but I think we've submitted it to some conferences. But if you, I should be able to get you some more information about this. So they're allowing you as a developer to come out in the field and actually use your platforms. Yes, but that's only because we've been working with the yeah. Italian fire, fire department for now, quite a while. Is this something that's going to continue? Are you guys going to continue to work with them and, and yes, basically you use, are, use your platforms and, and then you show us where we need to go? Well, I mean, with the, with the fire department, we work with them every year, yeah. either once or twice a year. So. You mean after this? After yeah, like this for project? example, in here, if you, if you would have found if you would have found something by flying over, you see you see a, a patient. Um, right. Oh well, this then was. You, then we go do our thing, and you guys continue working with your platforms. A general scenario would look something like that, but in this case, it was uh, it was mainly for uh, damage assessment to the building itself. But so yes, in the scenario, we have our simulations involved victims and everything. So we have done. Scenarios like that. Okay, so, so if, we, if you have a disaster this locally, or even you know another country over, you will go with the responders and assist them with your with your. Well, or no? I think this is just this is just the first stage. We're just doing this kind of a safe mission. I don't think we are. Um, we haven't run. We have run missions in which uh, firefighters have located victims and said, "There's a victim there. There's a victim here." Mm -hmm. But we haven't, I don't think we've done missions rigorous enough for the fire safety department to, to I mean, not at their level of... Uh, so I guess my question is, are you right. training them up to use this, or are you guys going to continue to use it in, in conjunction with the fire, um, fire department? Well, we're training them, and we're not using it at the moment. I mean, now all our... our oops. All our exercises are, are based always with firefighters actually handling it. It was in oh, the first okay. year that we had uh, us handling it to a okay. certain extent. Oh, so this is first year footage? Some of it before. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, we don't have footage of uh, firefighters actually. Oh, no, that's fine. I was just kind of curious if, if, you know, if, they're, if they'll learn how to you know, buy them and use them or, or if you're continuing to use them in conjunction no. with. In our scenarios, we. The, it's the firefighters who use it all the time. So we've done about two or three of these kind of user evaluation mm -hmm. studies. We have papers out on mm -hmm. uh, from a human factors perspective. So scientific papers, but rather from a psychology perspective to see how much user load there is on these firefighters. Mm -hmm. and they will cope with this scenario, what they think, what are the steps forward, and so on. Has there been an approach to you by, you know, Tech, which is his spec, Sorry, you stuff, there's a there's a, a semi-volunteer organization in Germany called THW. THW. Uh, okay. Yes. So, I mean, maybe I they have, uh, have they communicated with you about this sort of needs? Or? We we uh, we cooperate with two fire departments. They are our partners, so Dortmund, and, uh, Dortmund and them, and uh, Italy. And in Dortmund, we've done a couple of exercises too. So I. I I can't remember right now if we've done one in Dortmund and two in Italy, or one in Italy and two in Dortmund. One in Dortmund and two in Italy. So, but working with fire safety groups. So, um, and we ask them to design this scenario, basically. We don't design the scenario, we ask them to design it for us. And, and then we, uh, so they are really important to designing every aspect of our our user evaluation and then what they say and how they react to our system determines what goes in the next year. So it's constant, constant contact. I can tell you more about this later. Right. 
I think I'm almost at the end of it. It's just a couple of more videos. So what if the laser scan is mounted like this? Okay, I think that's between the tracks. All right. Uh, well, there's proof of concept here, but uh, uh, why? Well, it was to give the uh, first we had our height constraints, so we had to yeah. do within a certain height, right? And obviously, nothing could go above the flippers. That was the one thing, and it was still lower than that. It is still lower than that. The platform is quite low. But we have the, uh, the ladybug tree as well, and that needs a good field of view. I don't know what I mean, the layer scanner is quite an upside down, so the scanner is you could just as well. Well, I'm not really sure better. why we're doing that. I can probably get you in touch with the right people to ask that question. But uh, the reason we put it in front and down was to get out the way of the uh, field of view of the camera. Yeah, yeah but I mean, that, that's not the best position to like. Identify the terrain. Well, it works. You get a lot of scabs. Well, I, <laughs> I'm not the expert to discuss this with you, so I can point you to the right person. But I doubt that we, we have yeah. two little problems. Well, it does rotate. And yeah, yeah, I know the difference. But and we, I mean, we do realize that we can't uh, get a complete view of the uh, a laser view of the environment just from here. There, there are gaps, I understand yeah. what you mean, I understand what you mean, but once you turn a bit on the sides, uh, they reduce, I guess. That's your software. <laughs> Where is the software? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, I, I don't have it with me. Which part yeah, of the Yeah, but I mean, do you plan on publishing? Oh, right. Um, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, that would be helpful. Right. <laughs> The laser software is what you're reading. Yeah, no, but also I mean the topological okay. method. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, both the laser software and the topological mapping are a single part, so I can give you the information. Have you ever been uh, finished the yeah. two questions? Yes, after I'm almost done. Ten slides, perhaps. So this is uh, the interior reconstruction of the, uh, of the uh, deployment in uh, Italy. And that shampoo material. Again, it's a lot of moving around, so this will be found. And if you want to see these videos again, just ask me to show it to your given. I'll put them up on the Statistics because I'm not here. I don't know. Which I provide that to you. And this is interesting. This is what is also sort of new technology for us, which is structure from motion uh, from just the camera, obviously. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the reconstruction of this. Francisco Church, 27 minutes. And the UGV ran twice for, a, for one hour there, and price at Duomo for one, hour, one and a half hours. Uh, so in this case, we also saw that the UAV and the UGV can work together. And 
here we can go and survey the environment first, make sure that the, the terrain is traversable, uh, and make the path clear to the uh, other rescue personnel. So what we've learned is it's not really about artificial intelligence, it's more about uh, human-driven artificial intelligence. Uh, what the, uh, I mean as researchers, I guess we all have one side of us which would, we would just concentrate on one problem to see can we make this better and that better. But these instructions have to come from somewhere, these directions have to come from somewhere. It's better to spend some time uh, making sure that the rescue personnel are used to our equipment, that what we're doing is going in the direction that they find useful. Having too much data may not be, may actually be, may hinder their progress rather than help them. Uh, especially in stressful scenarios if you have, if you have to use a complex operating system or complex, uh, like the, uh, the bomb squad, uh, chief. Oh, so uh, yes, so uh, that kind of a thing, like a, a, a in interface, can be really complex, and we what we try to do is make it as simple as possible. So only what is accepted by our end users, the uh, service personnel, actually gets used. So uh, and that is our whole scenario. We have uh, field situational awareness. For field situational awareness, we have an infield commander. We have a mission commander that is remotely located uh, for team situational awareness. And we have a UAV operator and a mission specialist, two people to operate the UAV. So the mission specialist can communicate with the mission commander. The same with the UGP. And uh, the infield commander can actually look at what the UV and the UGP are doing and communicate it to the operators. So that's our focus one system, one team. Uh, robots and firefighters and uh, rescue personnel, uh, developers and rescue personnel all working together. And users driving the uh, technology. side of a wall yeah. and it just quit working or your robot did it around the wall? We don't have any, uh, we haven't done that much research into the uh, to the uh, communications part. We've seen that there are some people who approach this topic, I've seen that they've approached this topic in the last few days. <coughs> it is certainly vital to our uh, technology and other things. Yes, and this, this does happen. And what we do is simply we just bring the UAV back, but we don't have an automatic system that would be useful to like uh, store information and then send it at a later stage. So did you have to pretty much keep line of sight? Um, yes, yes, we have to keep line of sight. Yes. Yes. And, uh, that seems to always be the big problem. With UAVs, I think, Well, yes. with anything that you're using uh, wireless. Yes, but for UGVs, not so much. We have done without line of sight, but for the UAV, it's a little more flimsy, I think. You can have the best robotics, but if you can't communicate with it, then it doesn't really matter. It's no use at all. What frequencies yeah. are you Um, I'm not sure about that, I'm sorry. Uh, so the ground robot was 0211? Sorry? Was the ground robot typical off-the-shelf Wi-Fi? It was off-the-shelf Wi-Fi. It has this, uh, the, this bullet, uh, I don't know what that's called. Uh, do you, are you familiar with that, like a Wi-Fi? A cylinder. And this high powered, high powered transmitter. Yes, high powered yeah. transmitters. We've, we've seen them before in the league. So. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, which is uh, fairly good, but works work, wouldn't work for like a kilometer or something. Yeah. 
there's nothing for a kilometer. Right. It's really expensive, but there are some pretty reasonably low cost solutions right. that are implementable and not, not crazy. So it's about like five thousand, ten thousand dollars. Right. I don't think ours is that expensive, but it it is it works for our trials so far. Uh, for more information upon this, I could get you to the direction of the right place. Right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Really quick, and then we can go for a break. Uh, that structure from Ocean video was right. like done after one the pod or post afterwards once once you got the recorded video. Did you say on board the quad car? Yeah. But oh, the structure from Motion was done from the uh, from the camera of the UGV. Oh, okay, so yes. it wasn't... Okay. That's not the quad. Fine. And then on the quad, do you stream video or do you record it and then play it back afterwards? Um, as I understand it, we don't... We have... Uh, it's streamed video, but we have like a small webcam or something. But the quad cockpit has a laser that's more... Uh, that we use more than the camera. I think it's... We have tested with a small camera also. But we mostly use the laser to get a view of the post in the But we do stream the video when we use the camera to survey. Okay, thank you so much, Shankar.